Hey, I'm Ryan. And I'm Steve. And that makes this 60 Cycle Hum, the guitar buying, selling, trading, modding, fixing, breaking, reviewing, playing as I look through my ads. Should we play podcast. the theme music? <laughs> <laughs> All right, first ad. I should have had this pulled up and ready to go. Yeah, this was sent in by James Schofield. I'm assuming there was supposed to be a D that you didn't put on there. Sorry, Schofield. Where are you? Where is this ad? Why aren't these in order? In order of what? (sighs) Maybe we should start over. That's why, because the first one you put James Schofield... And then you cut off the D. You uh, cut off his D, Ryan. I cut the D off. I'm sorry. Uh. Sorry, James. I'm sorry. I cut off your D. So anyway, James sent in this uh, Westbury Deluxe. Uh, he didn't send it in. He posted it he to posted the group. It. Right. And it's like, should I get this? It's $50. And I'd never seen one of these before. And I was like, that body shape's kind of funky. I look up like other finishes of it to like get a better idea of what the body style is. And I'm like, damn, 50 bucks. Go get it. This thing looks freaking cool. I mean, the one that he's looking at is um, like kind of like a tobacco burst. And then I pulled up one that's like a cherry burst. Can you tell if the tobacco burst one also has a German carve? Um, it's a little fuzzy. It does. It does. Uh, that okay. does have a German carve. I think the German carve is super cool. Um, I mean, what we're looking at here for the listeners is... Essentially like a Les Paul concept as far as like a hardware loadout. It has like that harmonica bridge on it that came on like 70s Les Pauls and 70s Gibson guitars. Uh, I mean, you've got two cream humbuckers, a three-way switch, and, you know, four knobs. Yeah. And a three-by-three headstock with what looks like a brass nut on the uh, other product shot that I pulled up. Uh, I had never seen these before. They're, I, they're really, so I actually found an ad on, um, oh, and by the way, I'm describing the physical attributes of this thing. The body shape is not fully less polished. It's like a double cut, like kind of like pointy SG horns, but attached to a less Paul, like waist and butt. It's kind of in the vein of, uh, of the Yamaha, uh, SG yeah, line. Kind of, but like a little bit like offset with the yeah. horns you yeah know? except the horns are offset whereas the yamaha so it has like the point of the yamaha but it's an offset the yamaha i if it's not symmetrical it's in it's in that sg I space the, of being damn near symmetrical no i think the yamaha is actually symmetrical the yamaha sg uh double cut shape is a yeah. symmetrical guitar um so i found this on reverb for an ad for a westbury standard uh-huh. uh which was listed for three hundred dollars uh, and it said Westbury Guitars was part of the Unicord Corporation, which also produced Univox amplifiers and guitars. Cool. Uh, and the name came from the original distribution center in Westbury, New York. Uh, guitar making operations were moved to Japan in 1975, where they were made from 1975 until 1982. Production under the Univox name was halted after a fire at the Matsumoku factory. Um, after this time, instruments were made in Korea under the name Westbury. The Unicorn Corporation was purchased by Korg in 1985, uh, ending the line for good. So um, I'm not actually sure if these are Korean built or Japanese built. If they're Korean, they're early Korean, but they're definitely made for um, 50 bucks. Who cares? Go get it. It looks really cool. I like every part of these guitars that I'm seeing. I even like the headstock shape. Yeah. With that, like, dimple on the end of, like, a popsicle stick. (laughs) I like the little W, like, arrow and ribbon logo on the headstock. No, these are are really nice. And um, the Westbury stuff I've seen come up before as as kind of in that, you know, hidden gem of of 80s import instrument. Um, Like I said, if this isn't actually made in Japan, that Reverb article, article let... Seems like it's not made in Japan. I'm uh, sure but, this but is. But regardless, it's yeah. definitely made in the in the vein. I would be surprised if if they were, like, because some of the early Korean stuff they do shortcut a lot. Right, um, right. Just like you know, you'd see shortcuts in 1960s Japanese guitars. Sure. You see that in 1980s Korean guitars, um, but this looks really 
really nice. It does. I mean, 50 bucks is a no brainer for me. Like that is a head out the door right away sort of price on this thing. For sure. They have a whole website, Westbury, like a, like a history of Westbury. Oh, okay. So it's not Westbury's website. It's like a fan site. Uh, it's Westbury Guitars. I don't know who owns I it. I bet it's a fan site. It can't be. If they're no longer around, then it's not, you know, by the company for the company. They haven't been around in forever. Yeah. So this is saying that uh, Univox Guitars were built by Matsumoku in Japan, uh, which were the OEM suppliers to Westbury, Ario, West Tone, Epiphone, Fender Japan, and several other brands. Yeah, you already said most of that. No, but that. I'm saying like <laughs> I'm saying the other thing indicated that Westbury was only made in Korea. Right, 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 right. This makes it seem like they were actually made yeah. in Japan for a while. So. What's the max you would pay for something like this? Obviously, fifty bucks is a no brainer price, but you see this locally for seventy five, a hundred, one hundred and seventy five. Do you go get it? Do you start asking questions? Like you're not, you're like in this scenario, you're not shopping for one of these. You're not looking for one, but it pops up. What's the price that makes you curious enough to like start making offers or start contacting the person? Let's say like 125, 150, somewhere in that range. Yeah. I'm feeling that. Sorry, my mic is drooping. Especially if it was this, uh, this cherry burst here. That cherry yeah. burst is doing it for me. Um, yeah, I'd say 125, 150. And, and you know, that value is there. And it's got the, um, the this classy double cream humbucker look. Oh man, with the German carve, I like a, this. Checks a lot of boxes for me. I might be thinking about the guitar for a while. <laughs> I mean, people are trying to sell. You okay with your mic over there, Steve? What? It's because it. <laughs> this is a hot episode here. It's because my stand was crossed with your stand, so when I bumped it, it like collapsed. Don't cross the stands, guys. Gotta make all these adjustments. Classic, super professional. Classic episode. Um, there's some. <laughs> oh man, there's some. Go, guys, go on Reverb and look at. Just look up different Westbury guitars because there is some this going to really be my. Fun ones. Is this going to be my thing now? Westbury I don't know, guitars. Man. <laughs> Check out this bass. It's Whoa. an eight-string bass. Oh, no, it's not an eight-string bass. It just looks like it's supposed to be an eight-string bass. Westbury on reverb. But anyway, there's like what no... Pops up. There are no guitars on here for like less than $400, $350. I mean, this is a flip for sure. Oh, this walnutty looking one is very attractive. Yeah, but that's that's the standard. Like, that's a standard finish. That's not, Like, this finish is the deluxe finish. So this is like wow. a... This is a flat walnut top. The deluxe, I think, is a has a light carve. Whoa, this blue one with the weird pickups. Yeah, that was the one that I was like, thought was really cool. That's crazy. For three fifty. Some kind. But it's of blue, Ryan. Multi piece neck there with the stripes. Your your second least favorite. I know. Color. I don't like blue. It's Lego blue though, which is a yeah, nice that's bright different. blue. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, I don't like that dark denim like sparkle blue like gotcha. those those new uh, uh uh fender ultras mm -hmm. everyone's drooling over the blue that they come in and that's like the exact blue i hate i don't know if i've seen it there is like a there is a shade of cobalt blue that fender uses though that i instantaneously associate with um the bullet and affinity yeah. squire lines yeah yeah it just looks that is that cheap blue because they they put it on their cheapest guitars to try to sell the cheapest guitars now we associate it with cheap guitars. Yeah, and, and it's weird, be, but, you know, is that is that fair? I mean, probably not, but... I mean, they're the one that did it to us. It's, I know. It's fair. They're the ones to blame, not us. <laughs> so what's new, Steve, now that we've decided that he definitely should have bought this guitar? I don't know if he did or not, but... Hope you bought it. Hope you bought that Westbury, $50. dude. Um, what's new is I haven't used it yet, but I have a, uh, I bought a road in T USB. Oh, wow. So it's like the NT one, but it's a, it has a USB out on it instead of an XLR. And it has the, uh, it's meant to be used as like a standalone, like computer interface mic. Yeah. Yeah. All in one. So it has like, I didn't volume. realize you went for an NT. I thought you were getting like a snowball or something. 
I was looking at different things and I was asking, um, I actually talked to, uh, Joe from the just surprise me podcast. Uh-huh. That's what he uses. And, um, cause yeah, I just wanted something quick and easy and, but that was still like super good quality. So I just kind of asked around. Nice. How much do you spend on that? Uh, like 150, I think. That ain't bad. It came with headphones. That ain't bad, it man. It was like some cheap over years, but I mean, uh, I've already got a pair of other cheap over ears, so it'll be cool. It'll, I'll leave one of those sets on the piano because Melissa uses over ears on the piano a lot, and the other set will just stay on the computer. I'll have to figure out which one actually just sounds better playing music, I guess. That will be the computer one. Yeah. So I'm excited uh, to get to use it. Actually, probably by the time this episode drops, I think I possibly will have used it. Yeah. I, I, I th- Are you planning on doing like some interview type stuff with it or like doing phone calls into other podcasts or something? Um, or? Definitely phone calls into other podcasts. And then I know we've been uh, approached by some folks to do some interview stuff that I was going to use that for. Cool. Cool. So, yeah. Exciting. Or if someday one of, us, one of us moves away. We can still do the podcast via yeah. computer or something. I'll It'll just, look very to, strange in here with me sitting next to an empty seat. No, we'll have to. I'll have to get a webcam, and, <laughs> and you'll just put it right here. <laughs> that would be really weird. It'll be super low quality webcam. Yeah, there's some. Uh, there's actually a show like a baby monitor. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's a show I've, that I was watching on you on YouTube that is like. And it's like a huge, it's actually like a really big channel. Well, I don't know if it's really big, but it's like at least the same size as ours. I think it's bigger than, than our channel. Sure. Um, Not hard to do. And that's what they do is it's like three guys on webcams all talking to each other. And like the quality is really dicey, <laughs> but <laughs> I think the, you know, the other, there are other things about the, I think one, at least one of them is actually like a like a known in his genre, professional musician. Um, and I want to say he's like a ja- like a jazz guitarist or something. Sure. So he's like really well known. Um, so this channel has a big following because of the personalities, but the actual setup for everyone is just like three dudes and at their like home office desk, <laughs> <laughs> the backgrounds are just like, there's no lighting whatsoever. Right, right, right. Just background is like dark. You can like barely make out the dude every like 10 minutes. One of them starts roboting and then drops out, <laughs> but they get like, you know, everyone wants to hear like what huge, these... they get huge views because yeah. they're, they're known people. Yeah. So that'll be us. That'll be us someday. Just webcamming each other. So for my, what's, oh, yeah, new, what's your, what's new, Ryan? I have got this Wampler terraform right here. I mean, this episode's coming out on a Monday. This came oh. out last Friday. And now I can tell people about it. Uh, what if we do this and then they're like, no, no, we're, we're going to miss the date. Everybody delay. And sucks for them because it's too <laughs> late. <laughs> no, they're all ready to go. Yeah. I really yeah. like this is a different case design than what we saw at NAM, right? It, it is. It, it it's looks not like, like it. it's not the prototype. This is the production model. I remember the very first one being bigger for some reason, like a lot bigger. And yeah, I don't know. They shrunk it down quite a bit. I think that's how I remember it. Like, because they've been teasing this at NAM for like two years now, right? Uh, but I've had a chance to play around with it and use it, and I did my demo, and I gotta say, it's pretty dang great. I'm having a lot of fun with this thing. They really nailed like the core classic sounds of each modulation, but then there's plenty of room to get weird and wacky cool. with them. Uh, I really like the preset setup. Mm-hmm. How many presets do you think this thing has? Five. <laughs> <laughs> there's four leds on here it has eight presets oh how does that work because it'll be like one led the second led the third led the fourth led uh-huh. and then when you get into the second bank the uh you know five through eight or whatever mm-hmm. um it'll be three leds will be on and then the next led will be off and then the next led will be off and the next led will be off. oh interesting so okay. it's a different way of indicating your position in the presets that makes sense that's how i would that's how i got to five for what it's like i was thinking no ah. leds and then one two three four ah yeah that makes sense yeah yeah totally so they should have nine come on brian well get with no it. no leds would be like 
just your face. Oh, so it's not a preset, right? Right, right. right. But that it doesn't have that option. So you're saying, <laughs> I, so you're saying, I'm there's no there's no no preset option. No, it's it. Well, it's like you would select one of your presets and then you can start twisting knobs. Oh, and gotcha. Like yeah, um, and then you can select the preset. It kind of does the source audio thing where you hold down the tab tempo mm-hmm. and now you can select between the presets. So I could load a bunch of stuff in here and then select presets and scroll through them while playing a show live. Cool. Um, also. Something really cool about this mm-hmm. um, is you can run a loop through it. So I could put my whole drive section in the loop. Right. And then select with this switch, super easy, and save it to presets where that loop is in regards to the modulation. So if I want if I want one preset with a drive before courses, mm-hmm. then I've got that. And then in the next preset, I could have the same course with the drives after it. And they're my drives, you know, they're right. They're everything in my loop or anything else that I put in there. Yeah. Um, and it's just a super easy way to not have to rewire your board to put a modulation somewhere different. Cause I, you know, if I use the tremolo, I want the tremolo after the drives for sure. If I'm using the auto wah or the envelope filter, I might want those before the drive and with a multi, modulation pedal like that is just such a smart option to have in there. So that's how I'm probably going to wire it up in my demo. I did a full stereo setup with it. I'm not going to use that live, even though it sounds awesome. Cause I don't want to like have my church front of house guy have to run two DI boxes and, you know, try to balance the mix for me and whatnot. It's just easier to go mono and that sort of thing. But I'll be, uh, utilizing that loop for sure. Ready to do sponsors. I am. Let's pay some bills, Steve. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to draw this, pull this up. <laughs> it's, it's you know, I'm... <laughs> we have a new sponsor. Yeah, our new sponsor is Singular Sound. I've got a Beat Buddy right here. I've had this Beat Buddy since like the beginning. They were the first one of the first companies I hit up to do like a demo yeah. for, and it was like one of my first videos that took off for me. Yeah, and it's a damn shame I haven't done more videos with this because I actually really like it and I use it all the time. Um, it's an excellent practice tool, the Beat Buddy. Um, excellent like songwriting tool. A lot of people use them to perform too. I'd say, uh, I mean, I have this one and I've got the Digitech Trio. And I say all the time, like, if you're going to perform, this is the one that you want. Because the Trio just kind of gets you hilarious results that you can't predict. Where this is extremely predictable. Right. You set your, you put on your settings and you know what it's going to do every time if you've practiced with yeah, it. Yeah, the, the Beat Buddy is is probably I would say is their flagship product. It's what they're most known for. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a human like like it's a programmable drum. Right, right. Um, so it's it's a super great pedal. They also this year they came out with a six track stereo looper pedal. I want to get my hands on one of those called loopers. the uh, Eros Loop Studio. When they started teasing that on Instagram, I messaged them as like, when this comes out, I'm gonna want one. So yep. I don't know if they're available yet, but if they are, go check them out. Uh, it's a looper with a full color LCD or LED screen on it, and it shows you all the tracks right. and shows you where you start things and stop things and what whatever. I mean, the the, the, the looper trend forever has been these tiny little like ditto loopers. Yeah. Things. This is going completely the other direction, mm. giving you like this massive like looping computer that will allow you to really get into it, you know? So yep. I use loops all the time for demos and stuff and for practicing. I really want to check one of these things yep. out. They, they also came out with the Cable this year, which is a cable management system. Yeah, that's for like wrapping up your, say you got like a crazy 30 foot, 40 foot cable or something like that. You don't want to like sit there and wind it all the time and throw it in a box and it turns into a knot when you try to untie yeah. it. It's, it's like one of those things like you wrap up your your you know, your lawnmower extension cord in or your weed wax extension cord. And you can, you can wind it up and it perfectly winds your cable without any sort of human error and accidents causing your cables to fail. They look smart. They look yeah. cool. I, if I was a roadie, I'd probably have oh, yeah, for sure. a box full of those, you know? Uh, this Black Friday, they're doing uh, 10% off on almost all of their stuff. And any order gets you 200, uh, gets you into a, like a raffle for a $200 Singular Sound gift card. Plus, if you use the code 60 Cycle Helmet checkout, you get $10 off. What? Yeah. $10. And then that lets them know that you heard about it here, and that helps us. So yep. <laughs> go buy a Beat Buddy, guys. They also have the Beat Buddy uh, Mini or Junior yeah. or something like that. Um, I'd say that's a really good buy if you're looking to just like 
get into having like a drum machine and not getting like too heavy into it, it gets you all of the sounds and everything and the functionality just without kind of the bigger footprint. I had both of them and I ended up selling off the little one because this one was just more full featured, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this episode is also brought to you by Diderio. Oh my goodness. Diderio's oh, feature product for us right now is the XT string. Ryan has like 12 packs of them. Yeah, I've got a lot of he's, XTs he's over got here. Some, he's got some videos planned. One, um, two, th- okay, I won't count. <laughs> thanks, uh, <laughs> count. No, I've got like a dozen of them here because I'm going to do a live video where I try to change as many guitar strings as I can in one live video. And I told them that I thought I could do probably six or seven guitars in an hour. And they're like, great, we'll send you a dozen strings. Yeah. The, so. uh, the XT string is their most technologically advanced string. It has an ultra thin coating on all the strings. A lot of times when you buy coated strings, they actually don't put the coating on like this on the plain strings. Right, right. My understanding is that with the XT string, it's on all of them. I put, uh, I put one set on my Strat and I used my Strat at church this last week. Mm-hmm. It felt great. Yeah. And it's still like after playing it for essentially two or three hours in between practice and uh, practice at church and then two services, like I didn't once think like, oh, these feel weird or these feel like dull or plastic or something like that. They legitimately just feel like a regular string with like an oil coating on them. Yeah. I'll say it again. And, you know, I've said it before is they feel like the way uh, I feel like my strings feel after I do like a lemon oil cleaning yeah, yeah. on the fretboard. But it's but it's there all the time. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like your strings always feel brand new and clean. I live and the tone is the tone's great. You don't get that like dead tone that you normally get with a, yeah, with yeah. a coated string. I live in a territory where I want a fair amount of twang and a little bit of jangle on my strings. Twang and jangle. And I had no problem getting that with these strings on my strat for little sure. Twang jangle. That, that, that old twang Twangle Jangle. Twangle Jangle. They call me Ryan the Twangle Jangle Machine. Round town. No, they don't. That's weird sounding. (laughs) All right, so check out out the links below uh, to the sponsors and uh, go see what they got. Go do it. Go do it now. So this uh, this first topic is a little bit self-serving maybe because it references a video that I published. Yeah, recently. You, you did a video at, was this at TGU or at GearFest? This was at uh, 42 Gear Street. Gear Street, uh, yeah, yeah 42 Gear Street. This was Sorry. one at Henning Polly's house. And I was playing this Maybach guitar. Which is the one on the left. Yeah, the one on the left in this screen grab here that I posted to the Facebook group. And uh, in the comment section of the video, it kind of blew up of all these people like, oh, this is just a copy of like this guitar or that guitar, or blah, blah, blah. They're just ripping this off. And like my initial instinct is like, first off, who cares? There's a billion different variations of like strats and telecasters and less Pauls in the world. Why is everyone like so upset about this? But apparently it's like a recent like a more recent thing for this aesthetic of like a no cut, like parlor style electric guitar with P nineties yeah, and a sunburst and F holes and Oh, and the slotted uh, tuner headstock and stuff like that. So there's a couple companies doing this and everyone was just jumping on the video. Like, Oh, how dare they blah, blah, blah. I'm like, if a couple other companies are doing it, why does it matter if there's one more <laughs> company doing it? Um, also, I mean, jump any, in anytime you want, Steve, and with your opinions. But my opinion is like this style that is being done here is not original. Well, no. So that's what I'm, I'm it, looking at right now is I, I Googled parlor acoustic arch top because basically all the. It's an, they're electrics in the style of a parlor acoustic. And there's, you know, a lot of the things that people are getting bent out of shape over between different brands like doing the same thing. It's like these ideas have existed in acoustic instruments for hundreds of years now. Like this is not anything new. I think that's why people are attracted to it because it kind of looks like a super vintage bordering on antique sort of look. Yeah. It's just kind of a goofy thing to be like, I mean, I guess it's like, well, who, st- who started the resurgence? But, but I mean, it, at the same time, it, whoever started that resurgence, it, I, I guess I would, I would put it this way. It's like saying that if, Pure Salem, and maybe they do. I don't. I don't know their entire product line. If Pure Salem had a an instrument that was airline esque, right? 
And then, so people were like, oh, why does Pure CLM even make this? They're just ripping off of Eastwood. But it's like Eastwood is openly making airline copies. Like they own the airline name. Right, right. They have the, yeah, they own the name or the license or something like that. Yeah. So, so to me, like this is, this, and, and so, and what I'm saying is the Pure Salem isn't even, but it, then it's, that, the and, Pure Salem's not the same. It's just in the same vein. It, in that case, though, they are referencing something that is like, a, I don't know if it's trademarked or not, but I identifiable, like sourceable start point brand. What these guitar companies is, are referencing is like, oh, guitars that were handmade three, right. 300 years ago. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I mean, like parlor acoustics like this, ex, you know, even our, you know, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s right, instrument. Right. Um, but no, I, I completely agree. Like it's referencing something specific. It's referencing something that was made across the board. It, I mean, maybe a better example would be like if somebody, and, and I'm sure like there's probably some, you know, like bourgeois or, you know, one of these like ultra high end acoustic guitar companies that's already making these. Right. Uh, but not, but you know, without pickups. So right. really all they're doing is... Uh, the oh, P- there for sure is. The P90 is like a modern take, but it's like... what? Oh, if- also they have like tunematic electric guitar bridges and whatnot right. like versus a wooden saddle or whatever. Right. So maybe there's like some other things at play because you can't just yeah. put a Tom onto one of these things. Uh, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure they're all, they're all semi hollow with a big block down the right. middle exactly. to, to have exactly. that bridge, you know? Um, I mean, the one I played was definitely a semi hollow. And the funny thing about the one that I played, I haven't played the other ones. I haven't played the B and G or the wide sky or whatever. Right. Uh, the Maybach to me just felt like a Les Paul that didn't happen to have a cutaway. It looks like a Les Paul right. that doesn't have a cutaway. It felt like that. It didn't feel like playing a parlor guitar. It was a Les Paul with P90s that didn't have a cutaway, and it just had a certain look. It's a cool look. I dig the look. Yeah. But it's not like, oh, my gosh, they've really just reinvented the wheel as far as electric guitar construction. It was a semi-hollow with P90s. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this Relax, is a brand, everyone. This is a brand new idea, Ryan. For my <laughs> for my next trick. Oh, I, they're really if they were copying anyone, yeah, okay, maybe they were copying this aesthetic, this bouncing around between a few companies. Oh. Uh, but if they were copying anyone, it was for sure Gibson with the construction and the feel of this guitar. Right. And so Wide Sky is actually so the Wide Sky is very similar to the my is it my Bach? Uh that how it's pronounced? Yeah, my Bach. Um, it's really similar, but even you know the builder for at Wide Sky says that the P125 his his model is a cross between the Gibson ES125 three three quarter and a Les Paul. There you go. So it's like you know he's openly saying like yeah this is where what my thought process was like yeah this is a very very like Gibson ES style guitar crossed with a a Les Paul. All I think I'm trying to say is that people need to relax a little bit and don't act like this is some sort of hill people have to die on with look, the visual identities of these guitars that no one is mistaking for each other. Like, I don't look at the Maybach and think like, oh, that is the B&G. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the thing... I mean, the b and Gs are different. The, the, the F-holes are the other way around. The one thing that the... Uh, the B&G has more oh, of a parlor-style guitar shape, too. Like, it's thinner at the waist... Yeah. Uh, rounder at the butt, smaller, you know, where the horns would be is a smaller area. It just yeah. looks like a smaller guitar in general. The, uh, the, the fret wi- axis the wide is sky different actually too. doesn't have the slotted headstock. Right. It has a standard headstock. But all, all this to say, Ryan, is I have this new idea for guitar. And here don't, we go. Don't anybody steal this. All right. What I'm envisioning here is, um, well, it's kind of like a Taylor Big Baby. Yeah. But with the center block. Hmm. And strap pickups. Yeah. It's you, a brand new idea. Steve, you just invented a guitar. It's a brand new idea. No one do that. Nobody else do this. <laughs> Don't do it. If you do, I'm drawing, I'm going to draw a picture. Once I draw the picture, I own that design, right? Yeah, yeah. Now no you one own else. That. Not even Bob Taylor can own you that in, design. Yeah, it's you my in, design. You invented that. <laughs> Bob Taylor's does not have strap pickups on it. Sorry, Bob. I own it now. Apparently, Taylor's having a 40th anniversary. Which made me realize that Taylor Guitars is older than me. Because <laughs> I'm 38. 
Yeah, that he started in the 70s. Yeah, I didn't think... Uh, for some reason, I always assumed that he started in like the mid to late 80s, but I guess that's wrong. No, because he was... Remember, he talked about, I think, it was either the thing that you filmed or when he was on the show, he talked about how he kind of just lucked into this window where Martin took a dump in right, like the right. mid-late 70s. Like, nobody was playing acoustic instruments, and he just found his window. So going back to these my boxes, <laughs> B&Gs, stands for biscuits and gra- gravy. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> What does it stand for? Uh, biscuits and guitar. Dude, all I've had to eat today are pretzels. <laughs> what? You should have grabbed food on the way over here. Um, how close would these have to be before you start calling foul play? I mean, for me, that's generally like, oh, we start like copying headstock shapes and then like getting too close with the logo and things like that. I mean, if it the the Maybach gets really close in body style and finish style to the wide sky but then the wide sky leans so much farther into like the textured antique sort of look if you look those up um mm. that i wouldn't mistake one for the other in person so i i don't know what do you think do you think there's any danger here of brand confusion? I think the only reason this matters is because it's a it's a very small market. Um, it's a small market it guitar, so I could you know I could see somebody getting the Maybach and the B and G confused just because it's not a brand that everybody's doing, and so if it, it's a first glance thing. But you know, but then they could also confuse the B and G with the wide with sky. With the wide sky, and sure. I didn't see anyone like calling out those two because it's all about like the known, like the the knownness of right the brand. I think, and the, these are all like expensive guitars too. Like there's, I think the wide skies are all like seventeen, nineteen hundred dollars. The Maybach is like two grand or whatever, and then the B and G is like four grand and up. The 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 so B and G does have um like people. So the classic is thirty seven fifty. Oh okay. But the standard is which I think the one in the picture is actually a standard is fifteen hundred. Okay, that's not too bad. Um, so that's that's basically like they're off the shelf, and then they have like a their classic that's from their private build. So it's yeah, like, yeah. Are you buying something that's off the shelf? Or are you buying something that's being but still know, we're built talk- for you? We're talking about things that if people are getting upset about them, these are people who have an okay amount of money to work with. And I don't really feel bad for them. Well, and, and at that point, it's like if you're getting <laughs> those confused and you're if you're in the market to spend, and we've said this before, like if you're in the market to spend that much money, then you should be spending the time to make sure that you're getting exactly what you want. Oh, totally. And not just, you know, you're not going to go on reverb and be like, Oh, I got tricked. Oh yeah. And nobody's selling that. Like this isn't a case of like you go on your local Craigslist and a guy's got Fender Stratocaster, $200. And, but the pictures are blurry. And so you go to check it out and it's actually a squire and then you feel bummed and, but you, whatever, you know, then you have to decide if you get it or not. Or like the guy like wiped it off and put a new logo on it and oh I got duped I took the neck off and it's actually a squire not a fender and yeah. da, 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 da. like that's not happening here. Also like this is like th- someone was telling me that this style is blowing up because apparently Johnny uh, Depp has one and it's like if you're <laughs> if the basis for your brand identity is Johnny Depp. That's another point where did I he don't... like played in a in a thing? Is he he's a musician. Did you know that he plays in bands and stuff? Yeah, I'm a musician if, too, Ryan. You don't see me telling everybody about it. <laughs> you're a, you have a podcast about it. Oh yeah. <laughs> but if like your basis for like brand identity and authenticity in in you know brand styles or whatever with a guitar company is Johnny Depp, like I don't I don't feel bad for you. Did at you ever all. see The Lone Ranger? I did. I've never seen it. Don't. Does he still is he just playing like Native American Jack Sparrow in that movie like he does yes. with all of his other characters? Of course he is. Of but course he's like he is. one nine he's like one one twenty eighth Cherokee, so it's okay. It's not racist. It doesn't matter if it's <laughs> here's the thing. It doesn't matter if it's racist at all. 
it's still bad. They should have got like, it's not fun to watch. They should have got Chakotay to play uh, Tonto in the Lone Ranger. He's got to be like sixty five years old now. Whatever. Or something. Yeah, he, he's got the chops. It would have been. It would have been more fun. <laughs> they should have just brought in what's his name from from Bad Boys or Wild Boys or whatever it was. Will Smith? Not Will Smith. Martin uh, Lawrence? No. What was the one where they were cowboys and? I can't remember the name of it. People are screaming at their podcast players right now. Um, oh, um, oh I keep is is it Lou Diamond Phillips? It is Lou Diamond Phillips. Okay, they should have just gotten him, no matter how old. And he is. And the movie is um, Young Guns. Young Guns. Yeah, Phil Eisenhower over at the Gear Slum is screaming <laughs> at his podcast right now. The Young Johnny Guns. Depp thing is a whole other a whole other topic. So I actually there's saw. There's got to be. There's um, got to be. A, a Native American actor out there who would have killed that spot. Instead, we get, yeah, red faced Jack Sparrow. <laughs> it wasn't a fun watch. I'll say that. I did not enjoy it. I feel that like movie. I need to watch it just so and I can it had be nothing to joke. The, the part that made it not fun had nothing to do with any sort of political correctness or not. Right. It was just a bad movie. Yeah. That, I mean, that's why I've heard. How, how does it compare to Wild Wild West? Oh, Wild Wild West is fun. Yeah, okay. That's a fun movie to watch. Right. Yeah, it's a dumb movie, but it's a fun right. movie. It's got a big old mechanical spider in it. How could you go wrong? Exactly. All right. Um, <laughs> shoot. Yeah, the Johnny Depp thing. That's a topic we should hit on sometime. I, and one of the shows uh, we listen, or uh, that I listen to hit on it is the idea of, of uh, actors who are in bands and whether or not like Basically, the idea of like trying to figure out a band, like, oh, they're talking about Flea. Okay. Uh, they started out talking about Flea and how Flea, uh, I think, was in, as far as I know, was known for uh, Red Hot Chili Pepper. Like, he was in Red Hot Chili Peppers before he was an actor. Sure. But I don't know if that's actually accurate. I don't know. Because I don't Back know to either. the Future was 1985. Was Red Hot Chili Peppers? Not, yeah. Not, no. not the point. But the no, point, Red Hot Chili Peppers goes way back. They do? Okay. Yeah, super into the 80s. Um, but the point being, like, Johnny Depp is a case where it's like, the only reason anybody knows about him as a musician, presumably, is because he's Johnny Depp. Right. Like, uh, other, like Keanu Reeves is in a band. Yeah. But he's Keanu Reeves in a band. You're not like, oh, wow, that guy from a band... Is also an actor. It became an actor. And like you're not running Isn't out to like buy his records. Jeff Daniels, doesn't he have a band or something like that? Jeff Daniels does do music, but it's like there's like singer songwriting. I don't know stuff. what yeah, there's there is this thing to that because so does um Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges. That Jeff was Bridges, a Jeff I was thinking. Jeff both well, both Jeff Bridges and Jeff Daniels have like musical side projects. They Jeff should Bridges start a is, band together. Jeff and Jeff. Uh Jeff Bridges maybe might might be the bigger one of the two because he did that one movie where he played like he played like a country musician. Yeah, yeah. And performed like all of his own stuff in it. Um so I mean there are cases where it's like okay, like you're a mu actor with musical chops and it's like actually legitimate. And I think it's more viable for some reason in like Americana genres than when Keanu Reeves trying to get you to come out to see whatever that dog was. star dog star. That's what it was. Anyway, not the, uh, yeah. And Johnny Depp was in like American vampire, whatever band. I forget what it's called, but it was like, it was like, or it was called like Hollywood vampires. Oh, or right. Something. Right. Yeah. Was that what it was called? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think he's been jumping in and, and playing stuff with Aerosmith lately. Like that's this thing. Like oh, yeah. Aerosmith brings him out on stage and like, oh, here's Johnny Depp. And I don't know. Maybe cares? he's really good. He's probably really good. He he's has, probably fine. He has the money for lessons. He's fine. He's probably plays guitar great when the scarfs don't get in the way. You know. <laughs> All right. This next ad was sent in by uh, the inboxer Adam Dolhanic. Steve and I both screen grabbed this, so we have two sets of screen grabs. A little inside information there that no one needs to know. Uh, I thought this was cool. Uh, our buddy Mike has a uh, a Jaguar with this sort of setup. Uh, it's a Telecaster that has a Fender offset style bridge on it, like a Jazzmaster bridge or Jaguar bridge, and then a sort of like Tysco style uh, covered stop tail near the uh, the butt end of the guitar. And then underneath that bit of string that goes from the bridge to the heel of the guitar, there is a single Dan Electro lipstick 
tube pickup. When you change the strings on this, do you have to take that plate off? How does that work? I know. I think it's like a, there's like a little comb clip right underneath the edge of it that the string just kind of clips into. So you could just like run it like. Yeah, it's just like you put it in there and the ball and gets gets caught. Gotcha. Yeah. It's not like this. The There's the a thing you have to run the string through underneath it. It's right. a little it's a little hook. <laughs> right. I just. You can't see it. Yeah. Did you, you can't see it? It's the John Cena of bridges. Did you uh, watch the video for this? No, I didn't. Have Is it you, cool? Were you around when Mike had his guitar here and we yeah. were playing? Okay, yeah, yeah. So you you get the concept. You get what sounds would no, come yeah, out of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Drony harpy stuff. Yeah, it's kind of really like cool. a me- metallic reverb. <laughs> yeah. Because no, I get it. Because the uh the vibrations of your string are tr- traveling past the bridge into the strings and then you're picking up like this little splash of metallic yeah, so this, so this is on Reverb for $534, and it says, here's another one of my junkyard dogs that was made out of pieces I had floating around the shop. I was trying out some ideas, and some were successful, and some were just interesting. I was originally going to have a trim on this guitar, but couldn't really find one that worked for me. But even so, the pickup behind the bridge adds some interesting resonances and performance ideas. Here's a vid. The guitar is beat and relic. Some of the parts have been bouncing around my shop for years. Some are new, and some... Are older body and neck are probably 90s plenty of scrapes and bruises all over but the raw wiring is all new and clean as a whistle it's a fun guitar just don't expect a two thousand dollar paul reed smith he puts the dollar sign after the money like you <laughs> can be shipped with hard case for an extra hundred dollars this is a great guitar for someone wanting to experiment with a funky older style with funky older style pickups without having to deal with a goofy old guitar and bad tuning and intonation I don't put the dollar sign after the money. I put the percentage side and before the percentage. I thought you put the dollar sign after the money. No, too. I don't. The, but the percentage sign is the thing that I always screw up. Um, I think for five hundred and thirty-four bucks plus twenty-five bucks shipping. I mean, we're calling this thing five sixty. Yeah, I think that's a really fun guitar for five sixty. I'd probably click make an offer and try to get it closer to five hundred. But there's some fun stuff happening here. You think that's a Mexican neck or you think that's an American Fender neck? It's a Squire neck. It's a Squire neck that he rebadged. Yeah, uh, yeah, that kind of kills it a little bit. As far as I'm, as far as I can tell, I mean, it's got. <sighs> I don't know if I don't know if it'll if a Squire neck Telly will sell for close to six hundred. It's definitely a Squire neck. I think the tuners have been replaced. Uh, I think it looks like maybe everything on it's been replaced, but. Um... I'm like 99% sure that's a square neck. If I was someone super curious in this concept, I would be looking at this kind of hard though. Cause this guy yeah. did a really fun job of this. I even like the, the relic that's going on here with the, uh, you know, the bit warm, worn away at the armrest with a nice honey colored wood underneath there and some little bits of gouges and dings here and there on a kind of matte black finish. It doesn't look uh, terribly glossy or anything like that. This guitar is three hours and 20 minutes away from us. What? I thought this was out in like Nashville or something. No, this is in the Morongo Valley, which is just north of Palm Springs. That's crazy. Uh, Would you consider offering $400 local pickup and you just drive? I mean, it's a six hour round trip, but maybe you like plan a day in Palm Springs (laughs) with a little side trip up to Morongo Valley. No, that's a lot of driving. That's a full day. But man. I'm saying like, you no, that's what I'm saying. Like you, so you got to plan it, like plan something in Palm Springs. So maybe you go up there. I got an uncle out there. You do some Palm Springs stuff. Uh, which what is there to do in Palm Springs? You can go to, it's just hot and there's nudist you go colonies. To the, you go to the mountain, go to Mount San, oh, the mountain, Mount San Jacinto. Ride the tram. Ride the tram up the mountain. It's super expensive, but it's kind of worth it. How expensive are we talking for a tram? I want to say it's like 50 bucks a person. Damn, to ride a tram? Yeah. Well, it's like one That's of those. That's got to be a hot tram for 50 bucks. It's one of those mountain gondolas. I know. It goes all the way up to the top or whatever. So what? You can have a cool look of Palm Springs? Yep. I guess. <laughs> exactly I, you why. Know I don't want to talk about the money. Someone out there might buy this because they're interested in it. I just think he did a really good job on this. I think it's a cool look. I like the black uh, pit guard cuts he did to replace the bridge and to make a pickup holder for that Dan Electro lipstick tube. 
I think it's just classy. And I like the relic. It's a good job. What do you think, Steve? I like the relic. Um, the stuff on the back that you got a picture of that I did not. So maybe your picture. Yeah, I'm wondering if the reflection of the guy taking the photo is always there. Like, Oh, no, I, I, I grabbed that one. You didn't <laughs> grab that one. That one looks really hacked up, but I think it's just actually the quality of the picture it makes it look hacked up. It, to me, it looks like this thing didn't have a belly carve, and then he gave it a oh, belly carve. Uh, tickets are twenty six ninety five for adults and seventeen dollars for children let's ages go three ride, to ten. Let's go ride the tram, Steve. Um, so with your, <laughs> I so, can't believe you were looking that up. <laughs> both, both of your, both of your kids can pass for under three, right? Oh my gosh! Yeah, I'm gonna take the whole family out. I'm gonna offer this guy four hundred bucks. and take the whole family out. We're gonna ride the desert tram up the mountain. Dude, the desert tram's cool. I'm telling you. Steve really likes this Palm Springs tram. Okay, I'll do it for you, Steve. We almost did it uh, like a year ago, but then we ended up go driving halfway up to Big Bear. It, it took us like two hours to get bet from Redlands to halfway to Big Bear. Are we doing it's it? It's freaking insane. Are we geography podcasting? I hope so. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> Oh my god. 534. Gosh. I think if this is local, that's the problem. It's like if this is local, I, I've got to be under 300 to be interested. It's cool, yeah. but I mean, because of the neck, because it is a squire neck, it's I don't feel like I'm getting any sort of like deal here. Like if it was Mexican, I don't think I would sniff at the price too much. Because well, I think the other thing is he says like you're getting some clean work here, but he says they're funky older style pickups. Um, no, they're humbuckers. That's a those are humbuckers. You got to give me a little more information than saying right, guys. They're not just humbuckers; they're old humbuckers. Yeah, are we talking? Are these like airlines that are actual singles, or yeah. are they humbuckers? You know, they're, or, they're funky old style pickups, Ryan. I wonder. I they're wanna, funky. And I want they're old style. I do want to know in what way are they funky? Like the chicken. Yeah, if they're. If they are similar to a goose, I want to know how loose. Like the town. Like what town? Funky town. Funky town, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. You want to take us to the money zone again, Steve? <laughs> the, yeah, I don't think like you were successful in trying to make the sound you were trying to make. I was trying to make the money zone song. Okay. Um, this next sponsor for the show is Chase Bliss Audio. Yes. Makers Bliss of Audio. fine quality guitar effects. Yes. Pedals more creative than you are is what I keep saying about them. That is what they are. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why are we stalling out on this sponsor? I have no idea. Steve? Chase Bliss Audio. Uh, if you're looking for a great sounding pedal, they're a great place to start. If you're looking for a great sounding pedal that has every option that you could possibly dream of. Let me rewind you there a minute, Steve. You said a great place to start. Chase Bliss pedals aren't the place you start with pedals. You don't buy <laughs> a Chase Bliss pedal as your first pedal. You, I'm, you could. I'm gonna, you could. Chase Bliss pedals is the place you end up on your pedal journey. You're like, yeah, I've had vibes, I've had reverbs, I've had delays, but none of them could like modulate the time of the effect or like reverse ramp against the depth and the volume at the same time or like any other sort of crazy out there option you could dial in with a Chase Bliss pedal. They are not where you start. Chase Bliss pedals are where you end. Sometimes when you're running a race, you start and finish in the same place. And it's like that with <laughs> guitar pedals. You start and then like, but the thing that, you know, people do is they're like, oh, I'm going to start with these Behringer pedals and then I'm going to go to this other brand, this other brand. Right, and right. Then they realize what they really needed was Chase Bliss. So what I'm saying is why not start where you're inevitably going to finish anyway? Chase Bliss pedals. Live, laugh, love. A digital brain, analog heart. <laughs> Go check them out, chaseblissaudio.com. That was either the best or the worst sponsorship we've ever done in our entire lives. For them or in general? In general. This next sponsor is uh, mojostompboxes.com. Uh, through the month of November, they're doing um, $60 international shipping on guitars and free international shipping on effects. Go check out their website. They have a huge selection of rare and vintage pedals. Free shipping on vintage pedals is something to be thankful for. Yeah, and these are coming out of Australia. So that's. I uh, mean, free shipping out of Australia is pretty good. Yeah. 
Um, what do they, what do they, they have? just have like a huge selection. It's like that's they sm- their specialty store for like the old vintagey. Yeah, yeah. Kind of stuff. They smuggle them out of Australia in kangaroo pouches when the kangaroos are getting sent to zoos and stuff. It's true. They told me that, that. how they that's how they sh- save on shipping. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They have a kangaroo act like a mule. <laughs> Just go check them out. <laughs> you know, it's a really fun like window shopping experience. Even if you're not looking to buy, they've got a ton of st- old stuff that you wouldn't even know exists. Yeah, like crazy old like roll into pedals that you. I think even I'm gonna know I'm gonna buy something off of there at some point. I just need to really sit down and like Here decide what. Here we go. Super Rich Steve throwing his sponsorship money around. He's gonna throw it back into the company. About super gonna I'm, buy stuff. Just Extravagantly in, just rich Steve. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so go check out mojostompboxes.com. They're super cool. They're one of our new favorite sponsors. Is that true, Steve? Yes. Next topic. How long to wait to flip something? Asked by Tyson Brown. Typically when I'm making pancakes, mm. I wait about a minute. You don't time, I don't use a timer. You don't time pancakes, dude. No, you wait for the You the, watch the bubbles. Mm-hmm. When you get the bubbles on the back, you don't you don't flip it. When you have the bubbles, when those bubbles start popping, right. that's when you flip. When they start start popping. Right. I usually flip when they start when they stop forming because mm. to me that indicates that the bottom side is completely mm. that's safe. Completely firm. Just up. black. Completely black. <laughs> if you're not eating your pancakes totally burned to a crisp, what what the hell are you doing? Yeah, you know, this is how they make charcoal ice cream now. It's like making charcoal pancakes. That sounds awful. Charcoal ice cream? Yeah, but it's like that special charcoal that's like food safe or something like that. Like it's supposed to clear you out. I don't know. All the foodies are doing it. They're eating charcoal. They're making their teeth black. Eating charcoal. Uh, what about a hamburger, Steve? What do you wait for when you... when Are you someone who constantly flips until it's done or do you like are you like one flip and done? I am, uh, I usually do two flips. Two flips? Well, one, I don't really ever grill. I always just like pan it. Sure, that's fair. Um, but I do two flips because, uh, so I'll let it sit there for maybe like five minutes on the first side because mm. I'm usually working with like, well, it depends, but like lately I've been using a lot of like just the frozen preforms. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's no like, shame. I'll do like five minutes. And, I'm not going to burger shame it. you. Um, and then uh, I'll flip it again because all of the juices like start coming out the top of the other side. Mm. So I'll flip it again to just burn those off. Cause I, I, like with a burger, like I don't want it to be like too wet and with panning with u- using like a pan grill or not a pan grill, but like a pan, a uh, flat bottom pan. Yeah. Yeah. It tends to just all pool in the, on the top yeah. of the burger. Yeah, totally. And then I also want to put cheese on it. So, mm, so I'll yeah. usually flip it to p- move the moisture back down and then put cheese on that side. On the side that's immediately hot. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I get that. If I'm, if I'm doing like a backyard burger, like grilling one, um, my ideal is I let it sit there. I test it with a spatula when I think it's ready to flip. And if it's stuck to the grill at all, I let it sit a little while longer when it's done cooking in those grill marks, it will actually release. It won't stick anymore. Right. So I wait for that release point and then I flip it and then I wait for juices to pool on the top because that's the sign that you're getting into medium rare territory. And then just like you, I do a fresh flip and I throw the cheese on. What about steaks? Steaks. Oh, we're, t- we're talking about flipping everything here. You know, my I think my steak, my steak, uh, uh, style is the same as what I just described with the hamburger. It's the same sort of concept. You're, okay. wa- you're waiting for juices to pool and start coming out of the top. And then and that's how you know you're really close to medium rare. I have not done a, um, I have not done a steak that way in a while. Mm. I've been On the doing grill? the, well, no, just even, well, cause I, again, like I, actually, you can time steaks. You can be like three minutes aside yeah. and get, like consistent results. The thing that is tricky, I think, with steaks is it's all about starting temperature. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I, I try to let my steaks get to room temperature as often yeah, as possible. Yeah. So if you're if you're at room temperature, you can cook like a really easy medium well, doing like two minute, two to three minutes aside. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're colder, then it, that's where it gets dicey, and that's where I always run into problems because uh, I tend to not let mine warm up enough. Um, but I do the Ramsey method without all of like the Here we go. without all the garnishes. Mm. So I'll throw uh, I'll throw oil, like olive oil in a pan and do like a minute to a minute and a half per side. Yeah, including like so like 
all like five or six sides of a steak. Here's here's uh, a side so tangent. I cook the so I cook the edges too, but then I don't, dude. Don't if you're buttering your steak. I uh, explain in the comments. Justify your buttering of your steak. I thought you wanted to eat cow, not drink its milk. You're not drinking it. You're applying more more cow fat. I think butter has such a distinct flavor to it that it mm. ruined that it ruins steak in most cases. I don't want to say it ruins it, but I think it like it's a sidestep. Like it's in the other territory. I think it's a cheat. It is kind of a cheat. And I know like a lot of fancy restaurants do like the garlic butter and whatever. And I guess right, I'll right. put up with it in those situations. But like when I cook a steak at home, I just well, want here, steak, a, salt and pepper, right? olive oil. That's here, it. And olive oil is just to keep it to, yeah. from sticking to the pan. Here's what it is with the butter is our tongues respond really favorably to fats that melt at body t- temperature. And that and butter gets you that instantly. It's a really easy way to get that sensation of a right. fat that just spreads across your tongue. I mean, at you, body temperature, if you cook your steak just perfectly. No, the, I'm with you. The fat will be when I eat, perfectly. I, when I eat beef, I want it. I want to taste the beef. I don't want to cover it with anything. Like I, I a lot of times don't even salt mm. or pepper. I just do straight beef. Dang, I know I'm hardcore. Uh, a side tangent on this i know i don't want to get us too far off topic Mm -hmm. uh what's your bacon cooking style i don't cook bacon you don't cook bacon i almost never have bacon so you like if you get it do you like get the pre-cooked or something no i mean when i buy i i just don't i just very rarely buy bacon Mm, okay uh so it's kind of a mess i don't really have a style because i don't really cook it often enough to develop a style gotcha so i kind of just Get the pan hot, throw it down in the pan, and walk then I just away. Walk go away. To, go to work. Come back. It'll yeah. be ready when you get back. Pretty much, I'll flip it once, like to get it crispy on both sides. Yeah, but yeah. I don't. I haven't done it enough to really have a fully fledged out plan. Right. We won't talk about bacon then. What about guitar stuff? How long do you wait? Now that we've blown fifteen minutes talking about um, food, it depends completely on the markets. So if I get something off of Craigslist, I'll usually wait a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. By default. Um, that way, if the person I bought it from, like, is like, Hey man, I just sold that to you. Um, well, I'd like, say I like, could... don't flip where you bought it from. Right. So, I think that's rude. So if I buy something on Craigslist, if I buy like a guitar pedal cheap on Craigslist. Yeah. And I know for sure that there's a bigger market like on reverb. Right. I'll put it straight to reverb. I don't care. Right. Right. Um, the other thing I'll do is is because sometimes I'll buy pedals in in like I'll buy an entire pedal board at once is I will spread those out because a lot of times sure, sure. those pedals that you get off of a pedal board are pretty common. Um, so as long like that's the thing. So it's like so if you buy a tube screamer and then you immediately like list the tube screamer and there's something easily identifiable about that. Yeah. Then the person is going to be like, oh, man, that guy's like just jacked up my price, whatever. But if you buy a pedal board that has like eight pedals on it and they're all pretty common and then you just list like one or two of them and at, at a time in separate ads. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like I feel I, like let's let's list out some flipping etiquette here. Like I think we already touched on uh, don't flip where you got it from. You don't want to rub it in someone's face that you're doing a flip. Right. That just feels it feels cheap. Like if you get something off of Craigslist Flip it to Reverb. Flip it to eBay. Don't try to flip it immediately local. Flip it to OfferUp. If you're going to marketplace, right? If you're going to flip it local, I'd say give it a waiting period of at least like three months. You think that long? Give your make it feel like like oh, I actually used this and then I decided I didn't want it. Nah, I that well, that's why I'm saying like I think two weeks is enough time to like all be right, like oh, right. I messed around with this for a while and it just wasn't for me. But two weeks is still like a significant amount of time. Like yeah. if you're buying stuff just to flip it because you're like oh that's a flip I got to flip that, then most of the time you're going to do it right away, same day, whatever. I think if you're but if, if, if you're I, flipping enough, like if you're flipping enough that you have like a back inventory of flip, then this isn't ever a problem because you're just you're accumulating things and then you're kind of like slow releasing them to the world. So if you buy something new for the purpose right, of flipping right. it, it goes into your, it goes to the back of the list and you right. just you get to it eventually. Then again, like if you're, you're just filling up your flip folders, some of those things you just gotta like you, you know, there are some, some items that you just gotta be like fast on where sure. 
uh, you know, I mean, if you get yourself, I mean, this is an old example. Like if you got yourself a KTR and you know that they're out of stock, you got to flip that while they're out of stock. Yeah. You're not going to wait. Yeah. I know that's not the case anymore, but you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. If it's, you know, a limited edition, you got to strike while it's hot. Also, I, so I would just say like, though with the KTR, it's weird because I think with the KTR, like, uh, or at least the attempt to KTR flip, you're kind of just taking advantage of stupid people. Right. Right. Um, because it's like, they could wait. Like that's what we saw with all the, the chase bliss. Uh, what was the new one? The, the, the generation loss, the generation loss, like people flipping those for a grand next day. It's like, come on, you didn't even play them. You didn't even, you bought it just to flip it. And stuff like that is like bad etiquette to me. Like let it rest at least a week, you know, make it seem like you played it. But they're really working that angle. Like, Oh, it's not available anymore. And trying to work that FOMO of people who don't, have it you know i don't know it just feels kind of skeezy to me another big like etiquette thing for me for flips don't use the photos from the listing oh yeah take your own photos from take your own damn photos you've got a phone you've got a camera i'm sure you do yeah make a drawing if you don't have a camera drawing (laughs) no that's a huge thing and it's like i don't know how you're going to take a picture of the drawing but scan it you know scan it i think if you're um, put the put the pedal on a scanner on a copy machine and scan the pedal (laughs) yeah i think if you are just like reusing the photos like that's cheap well it's just also super lazy and it's like it's spitting in the face of the person who sold it to you when you should be thanking the person who sold you a pedal at a good deal. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's just like, you know what? It's kind of like you it, do that. Too, you do that too much. You're going to kill the flip market because people are going to get burned out and they're going to be like, I don't want to sell something. If someone's just going to flip it and use my photos and I'm, I'm done with this. You've got to be kind to the, inv- like to the flipping environment here. You know, it's like camping, like, You've got to take care of the area you camp in or it, right. won't, it won't be there for future generations, you know? At some point, um, it was, um, at some point, it's like when you're writing a paper and everybody in the class is writing a term paper on like, or like maybe like three or four people are writing a term paper on the same topic. Uh-huh. And so everybody's using, all those people are using like the same source material. Right. The difference between you taking your own photo and using the photo that the previous seller did is like the person who is writing the term paper. They're all using the same source. So everyone's paper ends up sounding very similar, but there's one person who just very obviously copy and pasted paragraphs off of the source. Right. Like that's what you're doing when you're using the previous seller's pictures. But it's also just like, it's just tacky. It's, they did the work. You do your own work. Take your own pictures. Don't copy and paste pictures over. Can you think of any other flipping etiquette as far as like time or how you flip or anything like that? I feel like those are the big ones. I mean, I think you just have to frame it in a way that, you know, obviously like, I got this at a sick deal because the previous seller was a dumbass. Yeah, that's what you do. No. Like, you know, just be a normal person. Usually when I sell stuff, I don't really acknowledge how, what any given length of time was that I have had it. Yeah. You don't have to justify what you're selling something at as long as it's a fair price. Yeah. I just try to make an accurate description of the condition of the pedal and say like, oh, I have this pedal. It works great. It's just not for me. Right, like, right. I think I think when people- It's pe- not for me. It's for you. I think when people try to sell something and they're like- this is my favorite pedal. It's like, so why are you selling it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, got to let this one go because I got another pedal. It's my favorite pedal that I'm going to sell next week. Like, yeah, don't try to qualify it. Don't try to qualify. I'd rather people just not say why they're selling anything. Like, I don't care why you're selling it. Tell me if it's broken or not. Yeah, and then don't, that's all you need I to know. I don't care why you're selling it. Oh, I got to sell this to finance my trip to five guys to get a hamburger <laughs> if someone was like oh, i gotta sell this because uh, i gotta make rent i'd be like that sounds like a reasonable thing but you didn't need to tell me like right also it's not gonna change whether i buy it or not put, when you put that kind of information it it sets you up to lose money because oh yeah you, oh you're you, desperate you gotta sell us to make rent how much is your rent oh you're selling you're selling this 1200 dollars guitar for rent well i happen to know that the median well not in san diego but maybe in another market like i happen to know the average rent in this county is 600 dollars a month so how about i just give you 750 yeah you're like, oh you need to make rent 
Uh, yeah, I could give you uh, 60% of what you're asking right now because I know you need cash right now or you could wait to see if this sells in a month, which yeah. will be past your rent and, the, and you're going to be, be homeless. homeless on the street with a guitar pedal that you couldn't sell. Sucker. Suckers. There's one born every minute and we're just waiting there to snatch that candy from that baby. Get that baby sucker. <laughs> I said the last ad and get out of wow, here. We gotta do some housekeeping. Housekeep us. Don't Steve? you want to know about the people who help us make this show? That's all I want to know, Steve. Uh, we're gonna talk about a couple supporters here joining us on the Patreon, sixty cycle hum uh, Patreon, uh, Patreon dot com slash sixty cycle hum cast. Sure, I never remember. Look it up; you'll be able to find it. Uh, at the three dollar level is Keck Skiller. Oh, that that guy. I don't know what kind of name that is, but Keck hey. Skiller. Thanks. Maybe it's Kex Killer. I like this three dollar level. This yeah. guy does not go. It's not with, one dollar. It's not two dollars. It's he's three. Ag- he's against the grain. He's he's walking his own road here. Yeah. yeah. He's like, I'm not going to pledge one dollar. I'm not going to pe- pledge five dollars. I'm going to pledge three dollars. Yep. And Deal then with uh, it. at the ten dollar level, uh, which is the inner circle level, we got Jeffrey Hatcher. Oh, fun. Uh, who I don't think I've added on Facebook yet. So if you can find one of us, we'll get you in the inner circle. Um, because. I think I tried to look up the name and there were like just a ton of Jeffrey Hatchers. Yeah, find us. Uh, so we'll yeah, get you us. in there. We it's should fun. Just, we should just add all of the Jeffrey Hatchers. Oh my gosh. On Facebook and then add them all to the inner circle and see which one, how many of them are like, why am I here? That's a bad idea, Steve. Uh, so the, anyway, all the Jeffrey Hatchers will see all our secrets. For joining the inner circle, I got a little. These mics are so hot. Little pack here. It's got an inner circle sticker. Oh, wow. Look at that little guy. It's got hair. some hair off of my floor. That's cat hair. It's got a, another sticker. It's actually got a bunch of stickers. There's some, Steve is prepared this week. You've some, got your little some pics in here. Your, somewhere. Little, pack, your little pack. I'll this, put together. Uh, inner circle pin. Oh, we still have pins left? We have a bunch of pins left. Damn. Um, That's how people will recognize you're really in the inner circle when we're at our secret meeting. Somebody so. said they broke their pen trying to put it into a guitar strap. Send them a new one, but, Steve. I don't remember who it was. And uh, so we're going to throw this together and we're going to throw in. Oh, yeah. We got some. Uh, some stuff out of our swag. Our swag. We got a Walrus Audio Tin. I think there's some. Sounds like some picks in here. More picks. We're going to throw in some Tusk. of these uh, Tusk TDs. These are the picks that uh, Stevie Nicks was singing about. Teardrops? Tusk. Why, why was she singing about them? Because that's a song from. Tusk? Tusk. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and we're going to throw in one of these uh, Amumu guitars uh, straps. This is like the old school flower design. That's so a cool that's really one. Cool. I like I like that design a lot. That's one that I would keep for myself if I wasn't already drowning in straps. I mean, we could just start giving out your other straps and you could keep this one. But They're all used. And I actually did give a strap away to that kid that I gave a Firefly guitar to. I gave that pink striped one to him. Right, right, right. Yeah, so we're just giving away old swag that we have from NAMs and stuff until we make room around here. Yeah. That's going to the inner circle. So it's not like a lottery thing. It's just like getting rid of trash. Dang. (laughs) For you guys. That's rough. (laughs) All right, this last ad is uh, sent by Chris Nichols. Uh, It is a Beretta body, an excellent Kramer Beretta body that would be awesome for a project guitar. They are becoming few and far between. No cracks or anything. Yeah, tell me more about this gnarly, sad Used. attempt at a refinish. Good condition. It yeah, it looks like it was, like it looks like someone put paint in their mouth and then spit the paint onto the guitar. <laughs> like that is how rough and sticky and how gross is this, this an looks. Excellent Kramer body. This is a ter- This isn't even. Is that supposed to be a Van Halen logo on the forearm cutaway? Maybe. I'm pretty sure that's what that's supposed to be, but it's like, but it's facing the wrong direction. Yeah, it's upside down. It's all corroded and like red, but covered in on the edges with this black paint. Why is the heart, why are all the switches and pots still on the body? Yeah, and they look like they were painted over. No, like, they were definitely painted over. This looks really bad. It, what what kind of paint do you think this is? Is this even spray paint? No, this is not spray paint. This looks like someone like finger painted house paint onto it. Jeez. It looks really bad. Or this maybe like good. they did like they did that before and then they sprayed over that black. Like maybe there's some other art underneath this or something like that. 
Because it's super lumpy and clumpy, and it looks like there's fingerprints in it, like someone was touching it to see if it was dry yet, and it was not dry yet. This looks bad, and I'm going to say $20 is too much. I'm going to say this could still be a fun project starter, but you got to spend hours on this with a heat gun and stripping chemicals to rescue it. Yeah, and this is not not a thing that I'm feeling, anyone should get involved with. I'm feeling five bucks on this. I mean, I guess if I think about the price, like from that perspective, because this is no, because I've sold good, like good condition bodies for twenty dollars because they were like no right. brand. So you have to actually be chasing a Kramer Beretta to see twenty dollars of value here. Is this an eighties Beretta or is this a music yo Beretta? You know, right, right. Like, there's no way to know in its current condition. I'm gonna guess this is a late nineties music, yo sort of Beretta because it doesn't have that full like Kramer Van Halen, like different shape to it. It's more just like your generic super strat shape. Yeah. I don't think this is going to be a desirable body underneath that paint. And you're really just passing on a project that you couldn't finish. I, I still say five bucks and that's like, that's like a politeness to ask for. Right. And to offer like, Hey, I'll give you money just to make this official so no one can say that I stole it from you. (laughs) I feel like I could see the $20-ness of it. Um, I'm not going to pay it. I don't think anybody else should pay it. No one should pay $20 for this. Um, But I think, like, if you're, like, a really, like, hobbyist hobbyist and you're wanting to, like, try out techniques on something and you're really good with a heat gun. Oh, my gosh. Or you've got, like, a chemical dip. Uh, then maybe you go for this. I don't know. You've got to throw this in the dip, the dip from uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit exactly. to restore this thing. And it's going to scream when you put it in there. Oh, my gosh. I don't this know. Is I don't have paint. anything else on this. This thing I don't is think rough. There's, I don't think there's any wood left in this. I think it's all paint. It's just all paint? Yeah. No, I can see some things <laughs> resembling wood. <laughs> but it would be a fairly easy um, body to throw a bunch of parts at. You throw a strat trim on there. You throw a humbucker in the bridge position, straight to output, throw a neck on there, and you've got yourself a hot rod, like shredder guitar. This paint job is just so bad. But you have got to get that paint off. Like, you cannot leave that paint it's on. It's not even like it's bad in a way where you're like, oh, uh, well, it's because... Well, it's all just black, you know? It's not like it's ugly, an ugly color or something like that. It just looks like so much paint. There's too yeah. much paint on this guitar body, and you can tell that it's sticky, like yeah, that is and, and sticky, it's, and gross it's like, paint. So I thought for a second, I was like, well, you know, like I'm thinking about like badly, bad finished jobs on like the paint side. It made me think of uh, Adam's uh, BC Rich. Right. But that the checkerboard, but that was bumpy because it was checkerboard. And so the layers didn't really work yeah. out the way. That was clearly home done, but it wasn't like thick and nasty it was just a home paint job right actually and actually i I think the problem really with that one that the thing that would have solved it is putting like 15 more coats of lacquer on it and then sanding it down this smooth this looks like it was dunked in a barrel of crude oil (laughs) this looks like it was the guitar that tasha yar was holding when she died oh my gosh (laughs) That's a good one, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, this song was sent by Aaron Grabmeyer. He says, here's a bluesy demo I made to test out a cigar box guitar I bought off Etsy. I wrote the lyrics after hearing a drummer tell a story that just asked to be a blues song. It's called That's All Right. out driving my Mustang tonight. I'm here singing the blues. I just got one guitar. She's got 20 pairs of shoes. That's all right. I'll pay my dues. If life was fair.
said she's got a headache tonight Gonna eat at her friend's I got to find myself some dinner Looks like PB&J again That's all right I'll pay my dues Life was fair We'd never get to hear the blues The band's gonna jam and cut loose tonight Finally get to sing these blues She says, try to keep it down, fellas guy has got to take himself out on a master date like he needs it come on man make yourself a flip of quesadilla go get go go to the steakhouse get yourself a nice steak go watch a movie you want to watch go see a show see a band or something like that you can do it dude you're gonna be all right <laughs> <laughs> bye everyone stay grounded see ya that was a-